I'm very pleased that we have next Volker Springel from the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics. Uh, he's going to give a series of five lectures, both on collisionless dynamics, that is the study of the gravitational end body problem, and on smooth particle hydrodynamics. Volker got his PhD in 1999 uh, uh, in Munich. Uh, he's most famous as the author of the code Gadget, uh, which came out in 2001, and Gadget 2 in 2005 for cosmological simulations of structure formation. Um, I think we all agree that um, astrophysics is the most exciting area of physics, and most of us would agree that cosmology has been the most active area of astrophysics uh, in the last uh, decade. Um, and I think uh, one could argue that studies of large-scale structure have been the most productive area uh, of cosmology over the past several decades. And Volker's code, I think, is, is one of the most powerful tools we have for numerical studies of large-scale structure. So I'm very happy that he's going to uh, tell us about it. Just one announcement before we start. Uh, we'd like to have the lecturers come down to the front of the auditorium uh, at the end of the talk and just before lunch so we can just meet uh, briefly. Thank you, Volker. Yeah, good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I'm afraid you have to bear with me also for five lectures in total, so I have quite some time. And I would like to use this time to uh, tell you about two issues, namely the n-body problem, how we treat stars and galaxies and dark matter in structure formation, also how we can use particle methods to incorporate baryonic material as well via the smooth particle hydrodynamics technique. So here you see a rough outline of my five lectures. So this morning, I actually want to talk primarily about uh, fundamentals of the n-body problem. And I thought that it's best to remind ourselves slowly about this. Uh, and so I'm going to use the blackboard to reintroduce some of the most fundamental equations that we then use in our numerical modeling. And on Wednesday, I'm then really talking about the algorithms, how we uh, calculate gravitational forces uh, efficiently on parallel supercomputers. I'll then move on to SPH and algorithmic aspects of SPH. And if I still have time next week, uh, I'll also want to address a bit the issues that SPH has encountered in terms of accuracy. It's challenged in, in several respects, and uh, therefore I would like to uh, discuss those aspects and also compare a bit with uh, finite volume hydrodynamics uh, to, to better understand where really the fundamental differences lie. If I have time, I'll also address then a bit moving mesh hydrodynamics that's sort of in between these two approaches. So before I actually start now, uh, Peter Teuben has asked me to remind those people of you who haven't signed up yet for the mailing list that's uh, available to please do that. So that is a good, I think, forum to discuss technical issues that come up. And so I think everybody should, should ideally be signed up to this list. <clears throat> Um, then the other thing before, before I forget that I want to mention is that on the wiki pages, these are uh, uh, pages that you know, are frequently updated by the lecturers with new information there, a couple of exercises have already been posted, one I think by Scott Tremaine and one by me, and uh, I'll add a few more exercise problems uh, tomorrow probably, and everybody who is interested is, uh, should feel encouraged to work on these and then also ask me questions in the afternoons ab about them if you have them. Actually, this afternoon I will be available in the astrophysics library from, I think, 2.30 to 3.30 or so. And please come up and uh, to me and discuss things, either the exercises or any other aspect you, you would like to, to talk to me about, <clears throat> also in larger groups. So as I said, I, this morning I would like to go th through some of the math uh, on the blackboard. But before I do this, I just want to show you one fancy movie that I made at some point last year that shows uh, what's possible today with collisionless simulations of, of dark matter. What you're going to see here is the cosmic evolution of a primordial dark matter cloud that eventually collapses to make, make up a, a big galaxy. In fact, the galaxy is of the size of the Milky Way, uh, has about 10 to 12 solar mass at the end. What you see at high redshift, so this has uh, been progressed to redshift 20 or so, you already see that out of this uh, cloud that only had very small, tiny ripples in its density fluctuations, you already grew a lot of structure, tiny little dark matter clumps that over time grow bigger and first make this sort of very finely knit 
filamentary cosmic web that you see here. And the cosmic web keeps growing even on these very small scales, develops more and more structures, the filaments get bigger and more massive, and halos coalesce hierarchically. Uh, you see how dynamic this process is, uh, <coughs> covers an extremely large dynamic range. And at this time here, about uh, one and a half giga years or so in the cosmic evolution, we already have something that you could call a proto-galaxy forming here. <coughs> in fact, this central region here is, is now bombarded with additional material that rains along basically filaments onto this proto-galaxy and makes the dark matter halo ever, ever bigger. Actually, at this time here, redshift one and a half or so, it has already reached most of its uh, final mass, keeps growing a bit more, but more slowly. Uh, but you see that the halo that at the end forms, the cold dark matter halo is uh, not at all a quiet dynamical system. It's extremely complex, it's alive, it contains dark matter substructures that haven't been destroyed, they keep, keep orbiting in this realized region of the, of the halo. This simulation here in fact has, uh, follows about four and a half billion particles and in the real rate is at the end about one and a half billion of those. And the colors that you see here, uh, actually in, uh, the colors encode basically the local dark matter temperature, if you will. This is a measure of the velocity dispersion that you have locally. We'll come back to this later. It's kind of a measure for the pressure temperature in the dark matter collisionist fluid. Now we're almost at the end. And <clears throat> you see how uh, rich this, the phase space structure is of cold dark matter. And that's something that we can really start to understand with high resolution and body models. And these simulations, even though this is only gravity and collisionless matter, principle very simple physics, it's very complex, and we need n-body models like these to actually predict how lumpy the, the halo is. Uh, that's important for understanding, among other things, the dark matter annihilation signals that you might get, or uh, for understanding whether disks at all could form in this, in this very violent environment. So this was just a sort of motivational movie, why we still bother with high resolution and body models, they are still, I would argue, the, the very backbone of cosmic structure formation also because of the fact that most of the matter in the universe is of course in dark matter. And we can only do structure formation in cosmology if we can treat this dark matter very accurately. There's no point in looking at the gas if we fail on this. So that's the most fundamental thing. We have to do well first and uh, then we need to also obviously treat the additional physics in the gas which is, however, far more complex than the dark matter. But we should not overlook the importance of the dark matter problem. And with this opening statements, let me switch to the, the blackboard. So if you could maybe lower, uh, raise the screen, put on some lights, then I'll uh, go with you through some of the basics of uh, collisionless dynamics. This is relatively elementary material, but some of it is will be new to, to some of you, I'm, I'm sure. And we'll also address issues like that are directly of relevance to the embodied practitioner, like gravitational softening and so on. What's, what's its role, how you should pick it, etc. So let me start then with the, the topic of collisionist dynamics. What is it actually? When do we call a system collisionless? Right? And to understand this, and we, what the systems we are talking about are, of course, self-gravitating systems made up of stars or dark matter particles. And uh, a collisionist system is basically one where you can neglect collisions. And when can you neglect collisions? You can study this with a very simple exercise. You, you imagine that two of your gravitating bodies pass by each other. And what we'd like to have is that in a collisionist system, this encounter with an impact parameter B does not deflect our a uh, star that passes by here with velocity v by a large angle. So, you know, an arch angle deflection, something like this, is, is something we don't expect in a collisionist system. Two body encounters should be unimportant. So, to work out how important this is, you consider simply the deflection angle or the deflection velocity in this direction uh, of such an encounter. And for simplicity, we're going to assume that the particle moves on a straight line, line so the encounter is small, is, is weak, and then we can just integrate the perpendicular force over time along this path, 
And then it's a very simple exercise to do this for gravity, and you, you get something like this, 2gm over bb, where b is the encounter, uh, the, the impact parameter, and b is the velocity. <coughs> So that's the deflection in the velocity that we get. And in a collision system, we, we want to have that this is reasonably small. So how do we now estimate that this is small? Well, we need to, first of all, consider the cumulative impact of many of such deflections. So consider, for example, a galaxy, very simple thing of radius r. And we, we place some stars or also dark matter particle in it. Say we have n of those. And then we would like to. To, to see how many encounters do we expect of a star that, say, penetrates here through the galaxy, once flies across it, and it, it will have uh, encounters of impact parameter b in a little ring of uh, psi of, uh, with db. And the fraction of the stars that we see in this will just be, obviously, 2 pi p db. We treat them all at rest for simplicity over the area of the the galaxy times the number of stars we have in it. So that would be the number of encounters we expect inside this ring during one crossing of the galaxy. How long does it take to cross the galaxy? But well, that's called the crossing time. That's something like r over the velocity of our star. And that means that <coughs> we have now that many encounters over that time. And the question is, what's the cumulative impact of these velocity perturbations? Well, they are random in direction, so the sum will be averaging to zero. But there is an uh, effect when you add them in quadrature. So the total perturbation must be something like the, um, the n that we got times the delta v squared from an individual one, uv squared. So that's the total deflection over one crossing. And that means we, ha we have effect effectively sort of a, a heating rate or a perturbation rate of the system, which is something like this, the delta v squared over the t crossing. And <coughs> we can now estimate a time scale for which this becomes important. Uh, and what do we mean with important? Well, important would mean that uh, the cumulative effect uh, over this time scale should be so large that we reach a perturbation equal to v squared, say, over the so that the velocity of our, of our star, star squared. So that means we can define a relaxation time scale simply as the v squared over the time scale for which, over the rate with which we perturb our system. This is delta v squared over the, the crossing time. Something like this. And then <coughs> we can also um, put in, in this equation, so now we, we, have, we can collect terms here, but um, we would like to put in a, a typical velocity of stars in a galaxy so that we can assume that uh, we take simply the circle velocity at the edge of the galaxy, so that would be something like g n times n over r. So this is the total mass, g m total mass over r, that's the circle velocity at the edge of the galaxy. We can use that as the typical velocity scale. If you then com collect the, the terms, what you, what you get is a very simple result that the, um, that's actually missing here the, sorry. When you integrate this, it should be, um, no. That comes in um, when you integrate. So the delta V squared is integrated over all encounters, let me, let me finish this properly. Then you get, um, so what we need to do is we need to sum over all the uh, possible impact parameters here. So we do this by integrating this equation. And it turns into an integral over the, uh, via this equation over the impact parameters. And when you work this out, you get um, something like 8n times gm over rv squared times log of something that we call the Coulomb logarithm. Yeah. OK, I'll, I'll start doing that. OK. Sorry for that. This is just in the beginning. <laughs> um, yeah, so <clears throat> this is um, the total velocity dispersion 
over uh, the total velocity perturbation squared during one uh, crossing. And here we have one problem this, in this integral that you carry out. You, you basically integrate dB over B, and that's a logarithmic integral, so you, you have to put in some ranges. The B max is, for example, you know, canonically taken to be the size of the galaxy. Um, here I need to write B min. But what's the minimum impact parameter for that? We usually take one where the perturbation is equal to the velocity itself. So that, that you get um, when 2gm over b min times v is equal to the velocity itself. So that determines your minimum impact parameter that's allowed. And uh, <coughs> factors of order unity in this you know, for picking the maximum allowed impact parameter or the minimum allowed impact parameter don't matter too much because they enter only logarithmically in this estimate, in this so-called Coulomb logarithm. So that at the end of the day, and maybe I should uh, write this result larger and on this other equation, other blackboard rocks. So. so at the end of the day, you get for the relaxation time, the following estimate is going to be n over eight times log of lambda. This is the Coulomb logarithm, the ratio of the b max over the b min, b min times the crossing time. So <clears throat> that's basically the fundamental result from this simple estimate, how important inter, uh, encounters are. And this equation is, is, is now important to, to gauge whether a system is collisionless or not. To be collisionless, we require that over the simulated timescales, or in any case, any timescale you are physically interested in, these timescales must be smaller than the relaxation time. If that's the case, then two-body collisions are unimportant. The particles basically move in a smooth potential. <clears throat> and collisions are unimportant. Now, how um, is that for, for typical astrophysical problems? So in a galaxy, we have, for example, very many stars on the order of 10 to the 11 or so, and the crossing time in a galaxy is of the order of, for the stars, it's maybe a hundreds or so of the Hubble time. So that means that uh, if you plug this now in here, you see that the relaxation times are you know, many orders of magnitude larger than the Hubble time for the stars in a galaxy. So for that, that means that for all practical purposes, we can treat the stellar component as a collisionless system, right? All the stars move in a smooth gravitational field that's, collect, that's uh, determined by the collective collection of all the stars. For the dark matter, if you assume that uh, the dark matter is composed of, say, 100 GeV neutralino particles, then you find that you have a lot in the galaxy. In a 10 to the 12 solar mass uh, galaxy, you will have of the order of 10 to the 77 or so dark matter particles. So that means that the relaxation time is absolutely huge. So the dark matter will always be a collisionless system at least if it's a WIMP, a weakly interactive massive particle, right? So if it only interacts, if the dark matter particles today only interact by gravity, which is the usual assumption. <coughs> That's, so in some exo more exotic theories, there can also be elastic collisions between cold dark matter particles, but we neglect those uh, for the moment. Not all astrophysical systems, however, that are self-gravitating are collisionless, right? And the most important uh, system where this is not the case are, for example, globular star clusters. And a globular star cluster has on the order, you know, a small one maybe has 10 to the 5 stars. And its crossing time, because it's very dense, will be short. So, you know, fractions of a mega year, maybe half a mega year or something. And then you can see with the relaxation time formula that this is going to be shorter or at best of order the Hubble time. That means that a globular star cluster is not collisionless. In, in fact, it's a collisional system, 
And those have to be treated very differently. So we here have a, a very different philosophy to treat them. So that's, that's a, a very first um, basic, basic comment that I wanted to make about the importance of relaxation. So once again, if the relaxation timescale is long to any timescale we're interested in, then we have a collisionist system. And that's always the case if the number of particles is, is large enough. Now then, if you have um, a collisionist system, now what, what are the governing equations that describe it? And the uh, most important thing here is the collisionist Boltzmann equation. Sorry? You threw it out in your integral of the LGD square, you threw it out the near close path, which would give rise to larger delta V. Can you just describe why that's okay? Yeah. You mean that the lower limit in the in the, the B min? Um, <clears throat> well it's this is this is first of all, this is only only an estimate. So you you this this trait uh, you know, this straight line approximation obviously breaks down if you have very small B min and you would have to supplement a more accurate treatment. Now in, for the real end body dynamics in the collisionist limit that we are going to be interested in, there is a natural scale coming in for the B min, which is going to be the gravitation softening. So here you don't really have this problem that you have, you know, extremely close encounters where the forces become arbitrary large. So that's not going to happen then, right? So in that case, it's okay to set there for B min the gravitation softening length, right? And it's generally, Scott Tremaine will probably have to, has the correct answer to that question. What do you do if you don't have any softening? How you ultimately justify that? But I think you have to actually supplement there more accurate treatment there. And it's, it's going to give you only an order of unity correction to this rough estimate relaxation time. So the, the collision is Boltzmann equation. Since this is so central, and I thought I spent some time on it, even so it's, it's on one hand, relatively basic, but I think in, if you're a practitioner of n-body methods, you actually quite often forget where this all comes from. And uh, when I work with students, I, I often realize that they, they forget that there is, you know, for example, a velocity distribution function present at any point in space. And because of that thing, I, I, I would like to spend some time to actually go through, through the basics here. So first of all, we have a distribution function. This is um, some function, some scalar function f, x, that depends on the phase space coordinates and the time, and we use that to describe the probability to find a particle at some phase space coordinate uh, x, v, that is, if I multiply this with an infinit infinitesimal phase space volume, I have the probability to find a particle in this region. I can summarize these phase space coordinates in one vector, x, v, say, and then I can write down a conservation equation for the probability, which is just the continuity equation. That certainly must be fulfilled if particle number density is conserved. So I have df dt plus um, some generalized divergence in this higher dimensional space times they uh, apply to the streaming velocity in this probability space. That's f w dot. So that's that should be zero. That's uh, just a statement of conservation of points. So in phase space, the probability must be conserved or it's basically equivalent to mass conservation if my points are um, moving in phase space. Now this is not yet the collisionist Boltzmann equation, even though if you write this out, it looks awfully similar to it. It's often sometimes confused with it. To actually get the collisionist Boltzmann equation, you have to you know, work, you know, you, you now um, write out this uh, with the product rule, this partial, uh, partial derivative. So we can do this and we, we reintroduce this divergence operator and apply it separately on x and v. So that gives you something like this, df dt plus the gradient on x, f of x dot plus dv on uh, f v dot is zero. So this is the same equation as I just had here. Now I, I apply the product rule. We are going to get x dot df dx plus f 
dx dot dx plus v dot df dv plus f dv dot dv equal to zero. So this is just the product rule. Okay, and now I claim that these two terms are canceling each other. And what's then left is the collisionless Boltzmann equation. So why do these two terms cancel each other? The most simple and elegant way to see this is to invoke Hamiltonian dynamics. So the system is governed, of course, by a classical mechanics. So each point is moving in a Hamiltonian system that's described in the self-gravitating uh, and body, if you like, system. And so that means I can derive the velocity from the Hamiltonian by taking the derivative uh, with respect to generalized momentum. That's uh, along an orbit. And I can also get the derivative of the momentum as minus dh dx. So these are just Hamilton's equation of motion. And now the trick is to apply uh, these partial derivatives to these two terms. And what you're then going to get is uh, in this term, right, you differentiate that thing with respect to x. And for that term, you, you, you put in a mass here to get the velocity. But you can get the second derivative of h with respect to first dx, then dp. And then you swap the partial, differ uh, partial uh, derivatives, which you're allowed to do. And then you see that the terms cancel. Right? I think I don't have to go through this more explicitly than this. So we are left then with the following. Whoops. I've already used all of this. Let me go over here. <clears throat> so the, um, again, this here is the, the collision of Boltzmann equation, one form of it. That's the first important result. And now we can use a few other things. First of all, that if that's the probability distribution function for finding a particle, then I can define the mass density by integrating out the um, velocity. So this would be something like this. The first moment of the distribution function is the density field. And <clears throat> the next thing is that I recognize that the velocity is here, the derivative, the acceleration is, of course, in a self-gravitating system will be the negative of the gradient of the potential. So that's uh, what I have in a self-gravitating uh, system. And then finally, I can couple uh, the gravita gravitational field described by this potential to the density field with Poisson's equation. So that's Laplacian on phi, it's 4 pi rho g. So this is uh, Poisson's equation. And if I now collect terms, then I basically can say that um, it can also replace maybe um, this g directly with the integral over f. And I have here the, the uh, gravitational field equation. And in the collision of Boltzmann equation, I can replace the x dot here with the velocity. And the v dot, we replace, sorry, minus, at least I'm helped here. That's great. You make mistakes. So that's the force, right? And this equation now uh, is the collision of Boltzmann equation coupled to the gravitational field plus the Poisson equation. That's really the fundamentals of, uh, well, that's what we want to solve with an embodied method. That's sometimes called the poisson vlasov system. And you see it's an integral partial differential equation because you have here an integral over this distribution function. And here it's another partial differential equation for the distribution function. And that's a very nasty system because it's high dimensional uh, on top of the, having this property of, of being an integral partial differential equation. So, um, and our numerical and body methods will basically be an, be an attempt to not solve uh, usually f directly on a grid, say, on a six-dimensional mesh in phase space. That would be 
very difficult because this, this phase space is usually sparsely populated, so you can't discretize that on a grid. You usually are better off to numerically integrate it with a Monte Carlo method, and that's what n body methods are going to be. So before I start discussing those, I want to uh, point out a few more things that are important uh, about the collision Boltzmann equation. And uh, they, they basically go under the heading of moments of the collision Boltzmann equation because that's often what's used in practice instead of them, uh, instead of the, the CBE directly. So first of all, the density up there, that's already a first moment, of course, of the distribution function. And the other thing that's important to, to always realize in a body system is that at any given little point in space, there's a full velocity distribution function. And that's very different from gas dynamics where you have a unique single value uh, velocity field. At every point in gas dynamics, there's one velocity value and that's how the mass moves. In a uh, collision system, at a certain point, there can be many particles that essentially cross each other and move in different directions. They don't interact with each other. Um, they don't only feel the collective gravitational field. So they can cross each other. You nevertheless have something like a mean streaming velocity that you can define. And that's just a moment then of the velocity field. And that you would define as an integral of f, d3f. But you need to normalize this to the probability at the given coordinate that you're looking at. This is still a function of x. So you normalize this by f d3v, um, right? <coughs> So that would be the mean streaming velocity. This is also important, so you can define that. But you nevertheless have a distribution of velocities around it, and maybe there's not a single particle moving with this velocity. It's just the expectation value of the mean mass motion. <coughs> Similarly, you can also look at higher moments of the velocity field, and, and of quite some importance is the velocity dispersion tensor. So sigma squared ij, that is, um, defined in an analogous way, you now take just different components, the mixed components of the velocity field, say VEI minus the I component of the streaming velocity, VJ minus the J component of the streaming velocity. You again integrate it over the velocity space and you take out the normalizing factor in the denominator. So now this is the um, so-called velocity dispersion tensor and you see that that's uh, for these two components, i, j, that's symmetric. It can be diagonalized, and then you get principal axis in which this dispersion tensor will be diagonal. But dispersions don't have to be the same in all directions, and in general, they are not the same. So you can have usually, and you will usually have anis anisotropic velocity distribution functions. This whole uh, story of taking moments that can be expanded further, and then you get something what's called the genes equations. And the genes equations um, are just essentially high other types of moments of, of the collision Boltzmann equation. For example, if we integrate the collision Boltzmann equation over all velocities, then uh, we get something like this. Just do the first one as an example. So we, um, let me write down again the collision Boltzmann equation. So we have df dt plus... Um, the velocity df dx minus the potential dv dx. And then we have df dv equal to zero. So that's again the collision Boltzmann equation. But now I can integrate this through again over velocities. So I integrate here d3v, do this everywhere. And also here. So I've already taken out. This uh, doesn't depend on the velocity. So I can, for example, take this in front of the integral. And now you can massage that a bit. For example, this partial derivative of time, you can move here in front. So that means that I can write this as, um, actually, I, I multiply through also with a mass. So that's already then more instructive, then the f times the mass gives you basic density, right? And then this first term, if you move this dt in front, is just the density, d rho dt, plus, and then the next term, you can, you can see that this thing is 
the gradient d, dx on rho the mean streaming <coughs> that looks like a continuity equation already if there's an equal to zero and indeed this term you can show that this is zero because this here is just a, a volume integral essentially in, in velocity space over a gradient and you can cast that with a divergent theorem into a surface integral where you have basically uh, the scalar f and the surface element with an outward vector in velocity space. And this surface integral is going to, go, going to give you a zero contribution because we integrate here over all space and the surface integral will be then a gigantic balloon and has its surface where the distribution function basically vanishes because so huge velocities don't occur. Right? So this term will go to zero and so we're left with equal to zero here. And then that's sort of a continuity equation for the mean streaming. It's one of the genes equations. Comes in handy sometimes. And to, to finish off this, this point with the genes equations, you can take a further very instructive moment equation. When you multiply, and I, I, in the interest of time, I don't go through the whole derivation, you multiply with one component of the velocity. So, you basically apply something like this to this genes equation, the integral d3e, vj, and then you apply this to the collisionless Boltzmann equation and integrate through and massage it a bit. And what, you, what you're getting from this is the following nice equation. First, you get um, ddt the mean, mean streaming plus and there's now a mixed moment here expectation value of VIVJ plus uh, a fourth term DV DX I times rho equal to zero so that's the next um, genes equation that we get by basically uh, applying this to the collisionless Boltzmann equation. Now in this form, it's not yet sort of the final most instructive form. Let me write this on the other side. Yeah. So by, by manipulating this lower equation on there on the left, you can actually turn it into a, a much nicer equation that's uh, really very nice. And that's uh, ddt on the velocity moment, so this is something like an acceleration in the mean streaming, plus expectation value of vj, dvj, um, sorry, I need to get the indexes, indices right. That should be uh, an i, I think. D, dxi equal to minus e psi dxi minus 1 over rho d dxj. And now here you have rho sigma ij squared. So this equation, when you compare this with the Euler equation of gas dynamics, you will see that it looks very, very similar. Here is, for example, the force, right, the acceleration, and that's the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the from the gravitational field, that's um, the acceleration here in the mean streaming. And the only difference, really, to the Euler equation occurs here on the right side. This term would be, in the gas dynamics, you would here have a D, dxi of the pressure. So the, you would have here the pressure gradient instead of this term. So that's uh, then giving you some sort of interpretation in this equation, what the velocity dispersion is kind of supporting the collision system. And it acts like a pressure, but it can be anisotropic, right? uh, unlike in gas dynamics. And that's also a, a basic important fact of collisions dynamics that you have essentially anisotropic support um, 
uh, unlike in, in gas dynamics. So, and then finally, before I um, get to and body methods themselves, let me remind you of a further moment equation that's sometimes useful. That again follows from the collisionist Boltzmann equation more or less directly. And that is if we multiply this equation here further, so this is the second Jeans equation that I've just recast in this form over there. If we multiply this equation over there with a spatial coordinate, xk, and integrate over all space, so now we have already integrated out the velocity um, information in the distribution function. Now we're going to integrate out, in addition, also the, the spatial distribution part, right? but we're taking a moment also on the coordinates. So we apply this sort of thing to the equation star. This is the second Jeans equation. And then <coughs> we get another very nice, e nice result, and that's the so-called tensor virial theorem. And that looks like this. So with some manipulation, once you do this, you, you can write down the, f the resulting equation as in the following form, there's a tensor jk dt equal to 2 times tensor k jk plus another tensor w jk. And what are the meaning of these things? So I, I'm saying this is, uh, once you apply this to the, the second genes equation, then you get this tensor equation. It's a simple matrix equation, and the different matrices that appear here are the following. This ijk is, um, yeah, I can write I, ij, doesn't matter. Or let me write jk to not get confused. jk is the integral over space of Malnas distribution, rho xj xk. So this is the second moment of the mass distribution, sometimes called moment of inertia tensor. But it's a uh, moment of inertia tensor is uh, usually de defined around one axis. So this is just the second moment, say, of the mass distribution, aka moment of inertia tensor. And then you have a kinetic energy tensor, kj. K, uh, and this kinetic energy tensor is now what you would expect. This is just one half integral over all space again, d3x, the density, and you now have the velocities vj, vk here. So that's the uh, kinetic energy tensor, and then you have a potential energy tensor, that's the yjk, and that's given by minus a space integral over rho xk dv um, xj. So this is uh, a measure of the potential energy. This is also symmetric, as you can show. And then you. Um, yeah, that's true. Here, you mean? Yeah. I have this. You're right, yes. Uh, the IJK, yeah, should. Um, mm. Yeah, I think so, yeah. It's probably. Yeah, Scott is, I'm sure he's. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you can probably, so, as you say, you can probably uh, normalize this and take out here the centers of masses, the centers of velocities, but presumably algebraically it works out either both ways probably. Taking out the centers, the, the invariant definition is a bit more natural if you apply it maybe, but. So let's, let's do it like this. So the, anyway, you, you are welcome to check, check any of these results. I'm sure you can derive those. Um, but I, I just wanted to 
to remind you of what you can do with the collision sports migration alone. So this is the tensor, so-called tensor Viller theorem. And one obvious implication of this is if you have a, a, a static system, then the left-hand side here will be uh, zero. And then you can take also the trace of this and you get the ordinary scalar viral theorem, right? From this, if, say, uh, the, this tensor is static, then it follows that the scalar viral theorem. And uh, the scalar viral, viral theorem is just very simple. Then this is basically 2k plus w equal to 0. And the k's and w are now the traces of these tensors. Right? You sum up the diagonal elements. You get the total kinetic and inert energy and total potential energy. So k is the trace of um, k, j, k, and the same thing for, for w. All right, so now um, we've discussed a bit the, the basics. And uh, in Scott's famous book, you, you'll find, of course, uh, much more elaborate discussions of what this all means and what you can do with it in stellar dynamics and in galactic dynamics. I unfortunately don't have time to even cover simple things here. I, I would now uh, would like to instead discuss n-body methods and what we do there to approximate a collisionless system. So we have already seen that the numbers of bodies in the real physical and body systems in nature are huge. And we can't directly solve the collision Boltzmann equation. But fortunately, we can make a very simple uh, uh, ansatz and, and use a very simple idea. We simply represent the real collision system with a different number of particles, which is typically much smaller. So we take a number of bodies n, and that number of bodies is typically going to be very much smaller than the real number of bodies we have in our physical system. And now we're trying to do, uh, or we, we claim that with that smaller number, um, we can still represent the real system approximately uh, because these bodies are essentially a Monte Carlo sample of the real underlying distribution function, which is the f that we're after in, in principle. But we never usually, usually look at f explicitly. So can we actually do this? Uh, and the answer is, well, this should be OK, provided the relaxation time for this smaller system is still very much longer than the timescales we're interested in. Right? So then collisions should not matter here as they have not mattered in the original system either. Right? So they, that's the simple philosophy. So we require for this to be valid that the relaxation time of the system is still small. Uh, sorry, much longer, or mu very much longer than our simulated time span, for example, or the physical time span we are interested in, say, Hubble time in galaxy formation. In that case, this might be a valid approach. Right? Now, the question is, uh, is this all to there to it? Well, not really. I mean, we don't, if we do this, we're not going to get a perfect solution because we have uh, a sample only of points, they will Monte Carlo sample distribution function, and the density field they self-consistently represent will not be equal to the real density field of the original system. So there will be, from this, systematic differences arising. Right? In particular, there's another issue that can, then comes up. For one, we have noise in the density field because we have only finite number of particles. But then also, the forces we calculate for these n bodies, they will not be equal to the forces in the real system, right? Because the density field is not the same. So the forces will be different, and the force field will be noisy. It carries Poisson noise from the sampling. And not only that, sometimes you will have a situation where two particles get very close, and then we get this issue that has been asked about, that the forces become very, very wrong because they suddenly become extremely large. And these extremely large forces um, are a real problem because they're unphysical. They are then generated 
just because we have a finite number of particles. And the, they will cause many unwanted effects. They will scatter particles by huge angles in contradiction to the collision system assumption. They might even make two particles be bound because their mutual gravitational field is now basically can, you know, be used to extract infinite amounts of energy if it's really singular and so on. And then when we have a normal time integrator, we'll also not be able to follow these very hard collisions accurately. And then we just get some random orbital integration, which is uh, uh, probably completely off the chart, right? So we, uh, to make this behave better, we apply a trick which is called gravitational softening, all right? So this great idea of gravitational softening is that we replace the Newtonian potential of a point mass, which is, of course, gm over r. So this is Newton. We replace it with a so-called softened gravitation potential. And the simplest case, or one of the most simple analytic softenings that are in use is the so-called Plummer softening that has this form. So you replace the denominator, the r, with uh, square root of r squared plus epsilon squared. And the epsilon here is a length scale that you introduce into the problem. It's called the gravitational softening length. So you modify gravity on small scales. And then the forces are going to be regularized. They're not going to be uh, very large. And that avoids one of these problems, that we don't get severely unphysical forces. We still uh, trade in another unphysical thing in principle, that we introduce a sort of a minimum length scales. Um, and this softening business is essentially uh, uh, always to be, uh, it's always a compromise between um, two conflicting demands. We would like to suppress the uh, unphysical forces on small scales and also have easier orbit integration. For that, we need gravitational softening. On the other hand, the gravitational softening implies some systematic effect because we actually change the gravitational force law we can't see structures below that length scale epsilon. Right. So that's going to be important to set this parameter appropriately in n-body dynamics. Now, this plumber softening here is not particularly nice in practice. Uh, the reason is that you see here that at all distances, the gravitation potential is actually changed. And even at relatively large distances, there's still a net effect from the plumber softening. And that's usually undes undesired. Uh, and you prefer uh, a softening that's um, basically compact, where the gravitational field is only modified below a certain length scale. And that, uh, what the most popular choice for this in cosmology is to use the so-called spline softening kernel. The idea here, you can derive this. Um, by replacing, so uh, we have the spline softening. And you do this by um, replacing conceptually a point mass, which is sort of a delta function in, in um, Poisson's equation. You replace that point mass with a little spread out cloud in, of mass, m times some softening kernel, r, say, over h. And h is a measure of the size of this little cloud here. And this, this kernel, w, is something we'll, we'll, vit, we'll see again in, in SPH uh, is then taken to be a so-called uh, B-spline. This is, for example, 8 over pi. And then you have two pieces to this, uh, 1 minus 6 u squared plus 6u cubed for the inner part, u smaller than a half, and 2, 1 minus u squared uh, cubed in the outer parts for um, u larger than a half and smaller than 1, and then 0 for the outer parts. So this is basically something that looks like a Gaussian, more or less, except that it has uh, a finite support. And it does go here at some distance h. Um, 
or one actually if I take the u coordinates, goes to zero. So that's the w that we use as spline softening kernel. So and that's uh, the little mass cloud that we essentially put for a point particle. And this kernel here has the property that, first of all, it's normalized to unity, but then also its first and second derivatives are continuous. So it's a reasonably smooth thing. And um, with that, you have um, a smooth kernel. And you can calculate now the potential that's kind of generated by this mass cloud. And the interaction between particles will then be the interaction of a point particle with the smoothed out cloud. So this kernel um, can be used to integrate up then the um, spline softened potential. And that you can do as an exercise. Basically, the idea here is that you solve with this, with this row, you solve Poisson's equation. And when you do this, then you get a modified force law that basically the, the potential of a point mass is then minus gm times some spline function r of r. And I don't write down the explicit form for this, but the, the important thing about this is that g of r goes to 1 over r for, for r larger than h, OK? So outside the softening, we recover the Newtonian potential. And inside the softening kernel, we have something that smoothly drops to uh, 0, OK? So not the potential doesn't drop to 0. The force drops to 0. So the, if you would plot the potential of the point mass, you would get something like this that um, you know, instead of being this 1 over r, you then, you know, at some point, you make a little nice trough like this, OK? So it's actually only positive, something like this. And so the force here, the origin is going to vanish. And maybe the Newtonian potential would go down like this. And the force would get ever larger. But you now have regularized this with the softening. And it has a finite support. And that's also actually very useful. Uh, also for um, gravitational and body solvers, as we'll see. So, sorry, can you repeat? Yes, yes. So there are other kernels that have these properties of being nicely smooth and doing this. You're absolutely right. And actually, it doesn't. It's my opinion that doesn't really matter very much which kernel you precisely take. The dynamics is going to be altered on the sub-smoothing sub scales anyway. As long as it goes smoothly to 0, it doesn't really matter the functional form of, or whether you go a bit steeper here and then come in like this or so. It doesn't really matter, I think, for practical purposes. As long as it has a finite support, then it, I doubt. Yes. That's what I mean, that w, the w gets 0 at some finite radius. Yes, that's what I mean with finite support. While, for example, you could imagine like an exponential function, right? It would drop very closely to, to 0. Right? It's, you know, it's almost 0, but it's never quite exactly mathematical 0. This, this uh, spline here is actually mathematical 0 beyond a certain radius, right? And at that point, you can apply a distance larger than that, you can apply also any familiar result from potential theory, right? Because the potential there is unaltered. While with other kernels that would extend further, you would be each time you'd have to rethink this. Right? Now, um, one aspect, of course, of the gradation softening, and that's very important, is what actually should we pick for the softening length? Is that and how important is that, right? And <clears throat> I've the first comment about this that I want to make is that we have seen in the relaxation time that this minimum distance that is in the Coulomb logarithm, that is sort of becoming the softening, right? And the softening, therefore, does not change the relaxation time much. It is a misconception if you think that if for a given n-body system, if you, if you realize, oh, I'm suffering from numerical n-body relaxation, 
oh, let me just increase the softening. This is normally not going to fix the problem. Only, it's only fixing the problem a bit if you, if you started out with a completely unreasonable softening that was way too small, say, or zero, and you got crazy orbit integrations. Yes, then int introducing a, a larger softening will help you. But if you weren't too far away from the proper softening to begin with, you cannot change the relaxation time scale much by changing the softening. You can only change it much by the number of particles because that enters linearly and not logarithmically. So the number of particles is key in collisionless and body dynamics and always will be. There's nothing better than using more particles. <clears throat> That's the first comment. But of course, uh, having said this, you have to have an epsilon, you have to have a softening, it needs to be um, large enough to pr suppress this very severe unphysical behavior if you get bound particle pairs, say, or very large angle scattering. But uh, still, we need to have something quantitative, right? If you want to set up a simulation you, you will encounter in a parameter file of any code, what is your gravitational softening length? What do you want to use? And so let me suggest a few things here. So um, before I can do this, I, I want to remind you, and I do this now in the context of dark matter dynamics in, in cosmological structure formation, and cold dark matter halos are actually, um, you know, they are spherical cows. They are surprisingly simple because they have, for example, all roughly the same internal densities to first order, right? Because from top hat collapse theory, you know that uh, a point mass perturbation will collapse to a, an object, to a realized object of a mean over density relative to the critical density at the real radius of about 178 or so. That's the analytic result. And it's customary to round this, top this off a bit and say that a realized dark matter halo has, say, an over density inside its real radius of 200 times the, the critical density. So what does that imply? So this 200 times critical density means that the mass, the virile mass of a halo, M200, will be 200 times the critical density times the volume of the thing, which is 4 pi thirds um, cubed r cubed r200. Right. So that's um, the simple relationship that follows from this uh, assertion that uh, all dark matter halos of, uh, say, mass M200, they should have an overdensity of 200 relative to the critical density in the universe inside the real radius. Now, the critical density is, of course, uh, 3h squared over 8 pi g. So that we know. And we can also define the real velocity that's typically defined as the circle velocity at the outer edge of the halo. So we define this as V200 squared as GM200 over R200. OK, fine. So these are a couple of definitions, more or less following from this. But if you now combine these three equations, you get something that I find very useful. And <clears throat> well, let me write this, this over here that fits just in here. Maybe I can express M200 as V200 cubed over 10 times GH and R200, for example, V200 over 10 times H. So that holds essentially for the outer edges of uh, dark matter halos. And what this means is that if for these three numbers, M200, V200, or R200, you, need to only, you, you only need to know one of them. And then you, need, then you know the other two, always. And for example, the circle velocity, V200, is very convenient for characterizing structures of different sizes. And uh, these equations are not only remarkably sim simple, they also allow you to do calculations very easily in your head. For example, if someone tells you OK, your circle velocity is 150 kilometers a second. You know that the viral radius is 150 kiloparsec over h inverse, right? And that's because it happens that 10h is, of course, 1 kilometer a second 
over Kpc h inverse. All right? So this is the same. So numerically, if you work in kilometers per second and Kpc, then the viral radius and the velocities are simply interchangeable, and that's often very, very, very handy to know. <coughs> but now we're going to use this, these things here to, to look again at the problem of gravitational softening. So let me look at the uh, binding energy of a particle pair, right? This is something that we absolutely don't want, right? So we, the picture we're now having is that, okay, let's do a cosmological simulation and we're going to get tiny dark matter halos first because we grow structure hierarchically. So there will be some tiny dark matter halos first. And in there, you know, there is a handful of particles. And the question then is, what do we have to do to prevent that this is completely unreliable and completely crazy, right? So one thing that's certainly unwanted is if two particles can start sitting on top of each other and then they're bound to each other, right? So this binding energy per particle would be, they're sitting on top of each other, would be sort of of order, say, one half gm epsilon per unit mass, this, Okay, then I don't have an m squared here. So that would be roughly, so the potential, for example, in the plumber softening at zero lag, right, is gm over epsilon. And then you can put another particle there on top and you, you divide, subdivide, say, the binding energy onto the two pairs. You get something of that order <coughs> for, uh, for a particle pair. And now what you want, for example, one way to think about this is that the random motions that you expect in the halo from viral motion they should have a specific energy that's much larger than this, then such bound pairs can't survive. Right? So we can, for example, say that the kinetic energy per unit mass that we expect is of the order of one, one half V 200 squared. And then we can use our formula over there and express the V 200 squared with, uh, say, the mass of the system. Then we get one half 10 GH M200 two thirds. So, and then the condition for proper softening, one possible condition is that we would like this kinetic energy to be larger than this sort of binding energy, then such bound pairs should not be able to stay on. And uh, that's certainly a minimum requirement that we would like to have. And if you do this now, then we can introduce, first of all, another very handy, this, sorry. I think this side, which one? Ah, this side works better, okay. Right, so we have this equation up there, and what we now want to introduce is the mean particle spacing. That's a key, key quantity too. That's of course, the background density times d cubed is a particle mass. So that d here is the mean particle spacing. And once I've introduced this, then I can cast this condition here for the energies into a condition on my epsilon. The gravitation softening takes something like this. It's 3 over 800 pi n squared times the mean particle spacing. Here's the third. So the softening is expressed here in, in units of the mean particle spacing. And that, you know, uh, we have, that's, that's already very good because it tells us, you know, you, uh, you don't have a special scale. The mean particle spacing is basically setting your, initially the mean particle spacing is setting your resolution limit. And now the question is, numerically, what can we do here? So obviously, what's the smallest conceivable structure that we can have. Well, if we put in n equal to two, what do we get then? Then epsilon is larger than say a 15th of the mean particle spacing. But now you might wonder, well, with, with two particles, 
certainly crazy to talk about the collision system, right? And if you go back to the relaxation time scale, which you should not forget, it's also clear that for a dark matter halo, you're not going to get away with two particles and then say this is a halo and it's behaving collisionlessly. Well, you see this obviously also from the relaxation time scale because the crossing time, that's another thing that's interestingly falling out of these equations. The crossing time for uh, some dark matter halo is then R200 over V200, and that's a tenth of the Hubble time. So that means that you have to have at least, say, you know, 80 or 100, maybe 100 particles or so to have a halo that's behaving, starts to behaving collisionlessly uh, over something approaching the Hubble time. But it's, of course, these are very diffuse objects. That's, of course, still uh, not anything that we would call good resolution. But you see that it starts, fortunately, at relatively small particle numbers for dark matter that you can uh, treat them as collisionlessly, that the reason is ultimately that they are not very dense, right? Dark matter halos are much more diffuse than a global or star cluster. So therefore, this limit is then usually kind of ignored and people go to a bit more aggressive setting. The, the reasoning is kind of, well, you know, let's maybe if you, for example, take n equal to five, that sort of would mean, you know, we accept that in, in particles that are, uh, in halos that are just, you know, three particles, maybe there are some correlations between the particles, never mind. They are not going to behave collisionlessly anyway. So we, we rather set the softening to something smaller. For example, for n equal to five from this formula, we get a 30th or so of the mean particle spacing. And that's roughly the range that are commonly in use. So in practice, people use between 1 40th for the most uh, aggressive setting and 1 20th or so of the mean particle spacing in collisional simulations uh, of, of dark matter. Okay, so that, that, that was more or less what I want to say about the softening. Now, um, I want to go into the equations of motion of, um, that we actually integrate now in an n-body code. How do we get those? We have already the uh, force. Sorry? Yes? Yeah, for the plumber, yes. Or if you mean for the spline? Yes. Um, yes, if you set the age correctly, you, set, you have to set the age to 2.8 times epsilon, then you get the same result. But this is sort of, yeah, so which epsilon, this is a source of confusion in the literature. What epsilon really means as gravitation softening length, right, depends, of course, what, you know, how is it defined in terms of the kernel, right? The age in the spline, for example, that I defined is, is, uh, well, you, you know, you get this, this gm over epsilon if you set the h over there uh, where the kernel drops the zero to 2.8 times epsilon. So there are relations of basic factors of two coming in depending on what exactly you, you do. And you have to, if you really want to compare different papers, you have to be careful, I mean, in terms of what softening lengths they used, you have to look what is actually the definition of softening. So there is unfortunately some um, there are some differences in the literature, so it's a, it's a point to, to be aware of. Um, and an epsilon is not equal to an epsilon. There might also always be a factor of, uh, of two or so in, in between. And, you know, also when you have different types of gravity solvers, say, in a, in a, as we will see, in a particle mesh solver, there's a certain natural softening. And, you know, you, how this relates to these kernels is, is there are always factors of two inside. You know, you can't just take the mesh, mesh lengths, for example, and say this is this. But this was just a rough estimate. You know, you shouldn't take this too seriously, but it is actually guiding you roughly to where the right numbers are, right? And ultimate proof is, of course, with this, is always that you, that you actually make numerical experiments and check does it make a difference or not, right? This is, with these sort of hand-waving um, estimates, you, you uh, usually are on the right track, but um, I think ultimately you have to test this often. 
So equations of motion in cosmology um, just remind you of uh, the usual convention. We have physical coordinates, and I use the, the uh, vector r for this. This is given related to co-moving coordinates x with this equation, and we have introduced here a cosmological scale factor that's uh, related to the redshift in the usual way, 1 plus c. And now, <coughs> from this it follows, of course, via time differentiation, you get that the derivative of r is the Hubble rate times r plus the peculiar velocity. And the peculiar velocity is just a times x dot, right? So this is a times x dot. And this is, of course, a dot over a times uh, a times x. And what we also need is the Hubble rate itself. This is in the friedman lemaitre cosmologies, very easily written down as um, the Hubble rate today. And then you have the uh, matter density, a to the minus 3 plus 1 minus omega naught, omega lambda, a to the minus 2 out again, plus omega lambda. So now um, we're going to derive the equations of motion for the dark matter particles and stars that we actually need in a cosmological simulation code. And we're going to do this in the most simple way, and that gives you nevertheless correct result, which is you're going to use Newtonian physics for the most part in a toy universe that's spherically symmetric. And then we can apply sort of Birkhoff theorem and ignore uh, if it's the outer parts if they are sufficiently smooth. So we, we consider sort of a, a spherical universe where our matter lives. And we assume that outside here the universe continues, but matter is totally smooth. And then, by Birkhoff theorem, kind of we, we can ignore that, and will not influence the internal evolution here. And then we can write down the equation of motion just in Newtonian terms. So, it's the acceleration of a particle will just be the gravitational force from all the other matter elements in this volume. This mj ri minus rj over the distance cubed, something like this. So this is uh, actually almost correct. Not quite. There is an interesting thing. If you have dark energy, or actually not dark energy, I can only give you the result here for a cosmological constant, then there is a further term here equal to omega lambda h naught squared r. So this you can't get from Newtonian gravity. But this term is nevertheless there. And, uh, but you see, this is quite interesting in physical coordinates constant in time. Right? This is just sort of a repulsive force between two points. In that sense, that's how it comes in at that level. And to see why you have to introduce this here, you basically have to look at one of the Friedman equations, the one that describes the acceleration of the scale factor. Remind you of this equation, that's a double dot over a. That's um, minus 4 pi g over 3 times the mass density um, plus the cosmological constant over one third. And actually, the cosmological constant, you can also parameterize this cos lambda as 3 h naught squared omega lambda. That's the same thing. And basically, from this Friedman equation, to get the correct limiting behavior uh, for a smooth distribution, you have to have this uh, term. And one way to see this is basically that this lambda kind of compensates some of the density acts here as sort of a, a negative density in this equation. And if you introduce this negative density contribution, so if you absorb this into this row term um, for constant density, then 
uh, you, you actually get this term that way if you interpret this as a, as a the, this part as the corresponding smooth part in row. So, and then we rewrite this into commoving coordinates, and that's simple uh, uh, variable transformation. Oh, no, I put this up. You can still see it somehow. Let me put this down again. Yeah. I think I can wipe this out. Let's just So if we, we rewrite this into co-moving coordinates, just make a variable transformation to the axis, we're getting this equation, x double dot plus two times a dot over a, x dot equal to, and now come the forces, g over a cubed, sum over j, mj, xi minus xj over so these are vectors here plus an omega naught h naught squared um, sorry one half over a cubed times x so this is then what you get and um, now this looks a bit strange and maybe unfamiliar to some of you. Uh, first of all, there's this term, that's called the cosmological drag term, right? So that leads to decay of peculiar velocities normally. And then we have the forces of the particles and then there's this thing here, uh, which is kind of odd. This is again sort of a, a potential here that gives us a, a repulsive force from the origin. And that's because we have this spherical universe Right? Um, and actually, that's okay. So you can use this to do a cosmological simulation in a spherical setup, right? ignoring the outer mass. And then this, this thing is just compensating the inward pull of the shell that you see inside of X. Right? But a more insightful way to recast this equation is if you now realize this, that this term, um, so if we again go back to our spherical universe and we are in the center and there's a vector x, so this, this term just describes space the force from this interior matter, right? And the outer shell is again in homogeneous density, if you like, you can ignore. And <coughs> this is, um, this means you, you can recast this into the mean density because that's, you know, replace h naught squared with the critical density, then times omega naught gives you the mean density that you have actually realized in the universe. And <coughs> that means you can rewrite this thing in this form, plus two h dot over a, x dot, um, minus g over a cubed. And you, you put in here a source term of the gravitational field the density variation relative to the background density, x minus x prime over x minus x prime cubed. And you integrate this over the volume. So now I've, not, I've changed from a particle representation to a continuum representation. But that's, uh, the crucial point here was that I absorbed this term into delta rho, and delta rho is the real mass density of x minus the background density. So it's the density fluctuations that actually determine motion now in this uh, set of co-moving coordinates. And that is now starting to look familiar. And actually, in this form, we can now forget about our spherical universe and say, well, I just make my sphere infinitely big and once I have it infinitely big, I tessellate it with little squares that all look the same. And I introduce that way a periodic universe. So that's what we're going to do next. So
So the idea being that from this equation of motion, where now the, the density fluctuations source the, uh, the motions, we, we um, first of all maybe introduce something even, even more formal now. There's something very often coming up, so-called peculiar gravitational potential in cosmology. And that's now defined like this, that we, you could define it in a, in a Newtonian way that we just integrate over all the delta rows we have. So these are always the uh, fluctuations around the background over x minus x prime. And then you see that I can express this here as gradient of this so-called peculiar gravitational potential. It's peculiar because it's uh, a gravitational potential that's sourced only by the difference of the density to the mean background density. And actually, this is, can also then be written as a Poisson equation. We have for the peculiar potential 4 pi g delta rho, the uh, peculiar potential is sourced by the peculiar density fluctuations. And that's very interesting because that actually means that this equation has a solution after all. If you would, in an infinitely big universe, just try to calculate the normal potential, right? You would have to integrate over all space and it would get bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So it would have no solution. And it's kind of related to the thing that's called gene swindle, that <coughs> you have to subtract the mean background, the mean pressure from it to, to be actually consistent. Of course, ultimately justification that this is all okay, right? It's a bit dicey here, is from perturbation theory in GR, uh, where basically you end up with the same equations. So that way you can prove that this is okay. <clears throat> okay, then um, we have the peculiar gravitational potential now. And now we can come to periodic boundary conditions. So for this equation, it doesn't matter now anymore how big the, the sphere is. In fact, um, the question is whether we, we need this to have a sphere at all, but we can make it infinitely. We can make it huge, very, very big, but we can't simulate a very, very big system. So then we replace the interior of the sphere with periodic replicas of boxes. So we tessellate the whole sphere with boxes, and then we have a periodic universe. Of course, there can't be structures bigger than the box, but never mind. This is, um, this is OK, because in many respects, this is a very natural model, of course, for an infinite space. Right? That's what we ultimately want. And we don't want that the boundaries come in anywhere. And that will be the case, because now the periodic universe can extend because you know, we have only one fundamental tile, and that's then periodically replicated infinite number of times in any direction. So the sphere is really infinitely big in that sense. What you uh, might come up with is then issues of retardation and so on that I'll discuss at, an, at another point. Is this Newtonian treatment actually OK? But um, I'm almost out of time for today. I, I want to uh, finish off, however, a few, five more minutes, if you allow me about these equations of motion, because there is actually a better way than to represent those equations of motion. In fact, um, this x dot here, has a nasty, this equation has a nasty thing, let me the drag term in here. Right? That's absent in um, normal Newtonian dynamics. But and we, there's one way to write the equations of motion in a better way, such that it's absent too in the cosmo cosmological integration. And for this, we will write this as a Hamiltonian system. And first of all, um, to do this, we should realize what is the potential or the solution of this equation in a periodic grid uh, of point masses. Right? So if, imagine we have this setup, but we place only one particle in our simulation, one, one, me, one <laughs> simple particle. right? Now, this is, we can't place one particle, right? If we place one particle, we place really infinitely many particles, namely one in every periodic tile. So the gravitational field we're going to get from this one particle is not going to be the field from this one particle. It's going to be the, the field from this grid, infinite grid of, of particles. And this infinite solution we can obtain from the Poisson equation. So what we, if we define the uh, gravitational field of this one particle as, say, a, a little phi here, then this will be given by the solution of the Poisson equation 4 pi g 
where we sum over all periodic images. So we have an n that runs over all integers. That means we have to sum over all periodic images. And we can put here a Dirac delta function, say unsoftened for the moment to make things simpler. So this is the coordinate of the particle in the fundamental cube. We can pick anywhere. And then we have it at an infinite grid displaced always by the box length L. So this is the box length L here. So we replace it with the, over this infinite grid. But we have to subtract. Since this is the peculiar density, we have to subtract the mean density. The mean density will be 1 over L cubed. And that's um, important. So this gives us actually, um, so I've dropped the mass here. That's now for unit mass. This uh, uh, gives us the potential per unit mass generated by one particle. And this term here is important because it, uh, that actually makes sure that this has a solution, this equation. It subtracts basically the mean density. OK, now how the solution is constructed, we'll, we'll discuss at another point. But uh, we can then say that the total potential phi of x in our box will be basically a sum over all the particles we actually put. So if you have now many particles, we can write down the real potential as just a linear combination of these solutions where the particles sit at coordinate xi. Right, so that will be our cosmological potential in which the motion takes place. And now comes the, um, the actual final thing that we want to do with this. OK, I'll take this blackboard again. Oh, let me take this other one. Ah, no, I'll take this. Let me wipe this out again. So we can, it turns out we can write this as a Hamiltonian system with the right choice of vari variables. And it turns out that this x dot is actually not, uh, even though, I mean, we, we work, of course, in commuting coordinates. But x dot is not the right, if you want, velocity variable. There are better choices. And in fact, we introduce a, a conjugate momentum, which is uh, the momentum of the particle m times uh, x dot. But we multiply this um, with a, with a uh, particular choice of the scale factor a squared. And then. You can write down a following energy expression, Hamiltonian, as a sum over all the particles we have, pi squared over 2mi a squared plus 1 half, sum over all pairs, ij, mi, mj, the phi. This is the solution of the point potential, xi minus xj over a. So now this is basically a Hamiltonian with a kinetic term. Here's our uh, kinetic term, p squared. And there's a potential energy term, which is just the binding energy in all the pairs summed up. And then you can um, show, so I can basically define here this as a kinetic energy T, and this I define as a potential energy, say, U. And if you now derive from this the um, equations of motion in, with the usual Hamil Hamiltonian formalism, so we get uh, the P dot of particle I is minus dH dxi. And of course, the um, xi dot, the drifting is the dh over the dpi. So then you can easily convince yourself that this equation of motion is actually equivalent to what we just wrote down before. But um, this is amenable, the whole thing, to the formalism of uh, kick drift integrators, symplectic integration, and so on that Scott Tremaine will discuss tomorrow, I think. And, um, 
And that actually means that in this way, we can write down much more accurate integrated schemes from this Hamiltonian. So the right choice of variable is basically this p and x. Right? So this is the best velocity variable to pick. Then there's also no explicit drag term. Right? If there are no forces, p stays constant. Right? So, uh, and you know, the, the decay of the velocity is then hidden in this a squared factors there. Okay, then um, there's another cor corollary from this. It's the cosmic energy equation, which I'll just finish off, then I'll promise I'll stop. And uh, from this Hamiltonian there, there's one interesting thing here. There is actually an explicit time dependence in the Hamiltonian, right? So that's important to, to, to be remembered. There's an, a t here in the scale factor, a of t. So in this t is an explicit time dependence in the Hamiltonian. That means that the total change of energy, dA dt, is in Hamiltonian mechanics always the partial diff derivative dH dt. And well, this we can just work out now, right? We see that um, over there in the T, in the kinetic energy, we can actually work out the time derivative. This is going to be something like um, A dot times dT dA. Right, so we take the difference at the derivative with respect to A and then take the time derivative here. dA plus A dot du dt. Well, these two terms we can evaluate very simply, right? They are both given as, uh, so th the first one is then a minus A dot over A times t, two, um, two times, because we have A squared in the denominator. And then we get here minus a dot over a times u. OK, now this starts to look simple. Um, so we can use this to say, OK, the total energy, if we, you know, the Hamiltonian, we can say this, call this the total energy. The total energy of the system, the time evolution is minus the Hubble rate times 2 times t plus u. So this thing is sometimes called cosmic energy equation or laser Irvine equation. So it shows you that that's how basically energies evolve in a cosmological simulation. And um, now it seems like, well, this is great. We, we have something uh, to play with to check, for example, energy conservation. Unfortunately, it's not so easy to use this equation in practice was for a number of reasons. Once, one, it's, it's not just a, it's actually kind of a differential equation, so you have to check uh, essentially solutions to this differential equation against what you numerically get. And it's also not so easy to calculate the potential energy actually very accurately at high redshift, because there it you know, tends to vary in the, in the discretized system. And there's, in the exercise, you'll see this, and I encourage you to think about this a bit. Um, okay, so. I'm afraid I haven't covered my last topic, which were initial conditions. So that I'll discuss then in my next lecture. Um, obviously, for any simulation, you need initial conditions and a good integration scheme. And that will be the topic then in Wednesdays. Thanks a lot.